Joby Masagatani, and I am the chair of the Hawaiian Homes Commission and the director of the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Um, first, I want to say aloha and thank you so much for taking time out of your day and away from your family to be here to learn about this project. Um, but our tradition at Hawaiian Homes, we always start with pule, and so I wanted to invite uh, Mr. Loving to come up and just open us with pule. Ehu mai, ehu mai, ikai ke mai luna mai. Ehu mai, ikai ke mai luna mai. O na mea huna noe ao o na mele. Ehu mai, ehu mai. Ehu mai. Father God, we know that you tell us love casts out fear. I would pray tonight, as we've all come together to build a stronger, larger Honomu, that you would help us learn how to be welcoming and collaborative and hopeful. In your son's name, Jesus, we pray, amen. Mahalo, mahalo nui. So um, we want to get started um, and to provide you with as much information as we can and also afford you a chance to have, ask questions if you have any. So I'm going to uh, invite up Sherry um, Kira Oka, I'm so sorry, of our, plan, of, of our planning team to start us off with this project. Thank you, Joby. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sherry Hiraoka. I'm with a planning firm. Um, we do environmental and community-based planning. Um, the company is called Townscape, and we are the consultant for the Department of Hawaiian Homelands on this project. Um, just wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping, a little bit of introductions. So um, thank you, Joby Masakatani um, from the Department of Hawaiian Homeland. She's the chair. Um, also, our project manager from DHHL is Julie Cachola. She's off over there. She'll be doing part of the slideshow. Um, we have Andrew Choi um, at the sign-in table, also from DHHL. And then I have Angela Fa'anunu, also from Townscape. She's right here in the, in the black top. Um, we also have a few others I'd like to recognize. Um, we have your uh, state representative, Richard Onishi, here. Um, let's see, who else do we have? We have our county councilwoman, Valerie Poindexter, in the back. We have, um, from the planning department, Michael Yee, in the front here. Um, from your community policing, we have Lieutenant Robert Fujitaki and Corey Hasegawa in the back. Thank you for joining us. Um, have I missed anyone from other agencies or elected officials? We may get a few more um, as the night goes on. I'm sorry? Oh, Diane Lay from R&D. Thank you. Oh. oh, hi. Thank you very much. OK, a um, little bit of housekeeping. So um, if you haven't signed in yet, please do sign in. Um, that's a good way for us to keep in contact with you, um, give you any updates, let you know of any further meetings, any further information that comes out. Um, also, we had three handouts back there. We had a project fact sheet, um, just a little bit about the project. It gives you the contact information for Julie and myself, as well as a map on the back. Um, there is a blue sheet. This is a comment sheet. If you didn't get a chance to say anything tonight, or if you don't like to you know, speak in front of everyone, you can write it on this sheet, hand it in to us at the end of the evening, or you can fold it and mail it to us. Our address is on the back. There's also, um, there was also a slideshow handout, but I believe we ran out because we have so many people here. So <laughs> thank you for joining us. Restrooms are in the back here, women's and men's. So I think with that, we'll go ahead and start the slideshow. 
We're going to do a quick slideshow just to give you the basics about the project, let you know, you know what it is that we're proposing, what we're thinking about, what the time frame is and the process, and then we'll have a question and answer at the end. So if, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Julie. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, Joby. Thank you, thank you, Sherry. Um, can you folks hear us in the back? Okay. So um, what we wanted to start with is uh, just a little bit of an introduction to Hawaiian Homes because we are a different kind of um, developer. Uh, and just in terms of the history of our program, just a little bit of context. So you have that when we start to look at this project. So. I'm always afraid to touch technology because it never works for me. Okay. Okay. So uh, tonight, what we're going to be doing is to um, just introduce this project, uh, speak briefly about the Hawaiian Homelands program and its trust to set the context. Um, we're going to talk about the project overview and then the land uses that are being considered. Um, take your questions and any comments you may have, and then the next steps. Um, it's important with this project to know that we really are at the beginning. Uh, so there may be questions that you have that we don't yet have the answers for, um, but as we develop the project may have more information. And you as being the neighbors to this project, we're really interested in finding out about the land, uh, how it, you know, what it's like when you live here, 24-7 um, and those kinds of things. So starting with the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, uh, we are a very different kind of department because our department actually started as a federal program uh, that was passed by Congress in 1921. Uh, this gentleman on the bottom is Prince Jonah Kuhio Kalaniana Ole, who was the second delegate to Congress and the person responsible for securing passage of the Hawaiian, Home, Hawaiian Homes Commission Act. You'll see up in the top, there's a light green line. That is the population of our people, the Native Hawaiian people. And you'll see, as many of you may know, the sharp decline in our population. Um, the orange was the increasing percentage of uh, those on our islands who are not of Hawaiian ancestry. So concerned about the plight of his people um, and the fact that many of our people at that time were facing severe health conditions or being displaced from their lands. The Hawaiian Homes Commission Act was passed by Congress to uh, bring Native Hawaiians back to their lands as a source of rehabilitation, uh, a source of recovery, of renewal for our people. So essentially what it did is establish the Hawaiian Homes Commission um, it set aside 200,000 plus acres of lands for, uh, for the use by Native Hawaiian beneficiaries and Native Hawaiian being defined as 50% Hawaiian blood or more. Um, and it was intended to promote quote unquote rehabilitation, which is a term from that period of time, which is the 1920s, really having to do with our well-being, our economic self-sufficiency, um, you know, just the recovery of a population, yeah. And how this was to be done was primarily through homestead leasing. Uh, these are land leases for 99 years that can be extended for another 100 years. Um, and also financial assistance in the form of loans, technical assistance, things like that. Next slide. Why this is important to all of you is that when we became a state in 1959, as a condition of statehood, the state and its people accepted responsibility for this program. So Article 2, Article 12, Section 2 in our state constitution uh, reads, as, as part of a compact with the United States, the state and its people accept as a compact with the United States relating to the management and disposition of the Hawaiian homelands the requirement that the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act be included in this constitution and the state and its people do further agree and declare that the spirit of the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act 
looking to the continuance of the Hawaiian Homes Projects for the further rehabilitation of the Hawaiian race shall be faithfully carried out. So I mention this because this kuleana for this program is not only the commission's kuleana, but the kuleana of the state of Hawaii and all of its citizens. And that is uh, something that we agreed to uh, when we became a state and is a part of our constitution um, today. So um, at the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, our particular mission is to manage the Hawaiian Homelands Trust effectively and to develop and deliver lands to Native Hawaiians. A very simple mission, not that easy to implement. Just as important, important is that we want to partner um, with others toward developing self-sufficient and healthy communities. So we recognize that uh, while it's an old program, it's going to be a new neighbor in Honomu, and so we hope that uh, as we move forward that this will be a collaborative thing to support the, the newest of our homestead developments that we hope will be coming out within the next 18 to 24 months. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Julie, who is going to walk us through the, um, the actual project. Thank you. Aloha, everyone. Uh, my name is Julie Cachola. I'm a planner. I've been planning for gee, almost 30 years now. I live in Wa'anae um, on Oahu, but my, my father and mother, from, my father's from Kohala, my mother's from Hilo, her parents are from Hilo, my grand, great-grandparents are from Hilo, so um, it's nice to be here and thank you for coming out. We've come a long way since 1921, and you know, we are the smallest executive agency in the state of Hawaii, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands is. And we administer 200,000 acres of land across the state. So we had to figure out like how to do this. We have, we have 10,000 lessees that are on the land. We have 44,000 beneficiaries that are waiting on a wait list to get on the land. That is what we deal with, that is our realm. So in order to do this more effectively, we have a planning system. It kind of is the same kind of structure as maybe you're familiar with the county planning systems, where you have a general plan that is a very broad statement of goals and objectives over the long haul, and then you have an island plan, and then we come down to the tiers into more specific planning projects for the community. I just want to bring your attention to this island plan. Because the uh, Department of Hawaiian Homelands, because the commission, the, the act was passed before statehood, right? You know, when it comes to land uses and zoning, we actually, the commission has exclusive land use authority. So actually we zone our own lands. And so the counties, you know, kind of have we have to work with the counties. And this county in particular has been very open and we have a memorandum of understanding which makes our relationship that much more solid. Um, so we, there's a method to the madness, I should say. The planning system relates to the act and on down. Our zoning, we call land use designations. And you know, we, so we have land use designations for residential communities, our agricultural and pastoral uses. So we have conservation lands, so we have lands and resource management type designations. And we also have lands where we have to generate revenue from. So like the Kuhio Shopping Center, for instance, right? Commercial development. Those are kind of like the broad categories of our land use designations, just to acquaint you with our planning process. Tonight, I know you're here to talk about Honomu, Honomu and we, so we want to just discuss, give you a background in this early stage as to what we're looking at. Why are we looking at agriculture? We thought, you thought the DHHL built homes. Why are we looking at Honomu of all places? We have 200,000 acres across the state of Hawaii. Why are we looking at Honomu? And I think, you know, for our beneficiaries, they'd be very interested in 
Starting today, how do we get to our wards? How do I get on the land? That is what they want to know. And so if this is the projection of getting on the land, then where are we right now? So that's kind of like what I would like to cover to give you an overview of where we're at on this project. This is the land at Honomu. Um, what we're trying to do is a subsistence agricultural homestead community. Keyword is agriculture. That's the focus, is agriculture. We want them to utilize lands for agriculture. We want to get them on the lands as quickly as possible. Um, they can build a house. We, well, we get into the details later, but basically our, the, pro, the project is an agricultural project. Why are we looking at this? This is a rural community, so we want to be able to, I mean, that made sense for us to look at the agriculture. Why agriculture? Well, it's in the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act. That, is, that was like part of the rehabilitation of the people was to get them back on the land to do agriculture cultivate the land. And you know, there's been 20 years since we had an award, an Ag Award. That's why our beneficiaries are, are very excited about this. Five chairmans, I've been there, I've been in the department, have seen five chairmans go through. Their focus has always been building homes. Nobody even talked about agriculture at all. When Joby became chairman, came into the department, she, from, get, from the day one, started talking about agriculture. This is something that she's been trying to promote, and so we are here to kind of <clears throat> trying to apply agriculture. Um, you know, why are we looking at agriculture is also, you know, for sustainability purposes. This trust is in perpetuity. It's inalienable. We can't sell it. So this trust will continue on. But how can we look at in perpetuity if we're not looking at being resilient on the land and having sustainable practices on the land? So we need to get back to that space. You know, so while five chairmen have come through and like wanted to build homes and get homes built, actually what has happened is the agricultural wait list is the biggest wait list we have now. It, it surpasses the residential wait list, except for Oahu, and you can see this graphic here. Oh, let's see. Um, this is Oahu, this is the residential um, wait list. But on all other islands, if you look at this red line, it exceeds the demand for residential uh, homestead. They want agriculture. Um, but look at where our leases are. This is our current lease situation. 84% of our leases right now are in residential. Right, so th there's been a neglect of pushing the agriculture um, land use, of pushing agricultural homesteading that we're trying to address here and make this available. On top of the need for agriculture, there are opportunities for agriculture. We do have some ag lessees that you know, are on the land for agriculture purposes. Unfortunately, only about 5% of them are really doing anything with agriculture. So we see that this is an opportunity to go in and say, hey, how can we help? How can we make this work? We have, we have paid CTAR, UH, Hilo. We have a paid full-time person to work with our egg lessees on Hawaiian homelands. That's all she does is to work for our people. So that resource is right there. Um, when we, when we got focused on residential development, we, we, we got into a lot of program, programmatic supports, counseling, case management, you know, really helping them to do financial planning so that they could manage a mortgage and get a home loan. It, but this is not, this kind of programmatic support has not happened for, for agriculture. Besides the CTAR person, we haven't really try to structure some kind of support system to make sure that agriculture is successful. So there's an opportunity to develop that programmatic support. There's an opportunity, and I'm, as a planner, as a land use planner, they, we always cut up the lands and put houses on it. 
this is not this is an opportunity to plan a community an agricultural community and actually look at what kind of support facility should be in place to support agriculture let's plan it together you know i have this thing about having to backfit the pico after the fact it's like no let's go in and do this right so there's agricultural opportunities here i should move this slide so in anticipation for agriculture, when Joey first came on board, I said that this was a priority. One of the things that needed to be in place is that we needed to actually get our rules, our administrative rules in order so that it could support what we were trying to do. So we did that um, between, in, between in 2015 to 2017. It's a, very, it's a long process of administrative rules. Um, went out to public hearings and beneficiary consultation, and we finally passed it. So we have new rules in place. As of March of this year, we have new rules for agri uh, subsistence agriculture. So what? So this poses the opportunity. Now we're ready to kind of implement that. So the timing is just right there. What the ag, the subsistence ag rules say, is that. We're looking at smaller lots. We're not looking at the 10 acre lot, the 40 acre lot. We're looking at not more than three acres. And I think in Honomu, the, the resource is so rich that you know, it would be, might be less than that, as much as we can put in. But lots must be less than three acres. A farm plan, which is usually required for our ag lessees, a farm plan is not required because we're looking at subsistence agriculture. But agriculture use and cultivation is required. And we're, uh, the rule says they have three years to kind of do some, to put something in the ground to have some kind of agriculture activity, subsistence activity happening on the, on the lot. And this is a big question everybody always asks me. What about the home? Do they have to build the home? No, that's optional. They can though. There are, they can if they want to, but it is not required. What is required is agriculture cultivation, some kind of subsistence agriculture cultivation. So this is what the new rules specify. This is what we're trying to implement now. So people just hearing about it, they're calling me up. How did I get on the list? It's like it's not like that because we already have people on the list, right? They've been waiting. So actually, we sent out inv inv invitations to the top 500 people on the ag wait list. And so I've come to know, look at this, this cohort and to, to find out, like, who are these people? Where do they live? What do they do? Actually, the, this cohort, the five, first 500 people on the list, had applied in 1952. The last one, the, like number 500, had applied in 1985. That is the cohort we're dealing with right now. And these people, on the average, the average uh, age on the wait list is 66. Okay? That's how long they've been waiting. So we hope that they will come with their whole ohana and support system and we can do training and empowerment one time so that, because if I'm 66, I might have a hard time doing that kind of subsistence agriculture every day, or you know, even if it's just fruit trees. Um, so that's who we're dealing with. Why are we looking at Big Island? And you should know this, because this is really interesting when you look at the data. Um, this is the distribution of our lands. 58% of our lands on Big Island. 58% of our lands are on the Big Island. This is the, distrib oh, this is the distribution of our agless. Distribution of, I'm sorry, of our lands that have been zoned for ag. So our ag lands are distributed here. So our ag lands on Hawaii constitute 42% of our land base has been designated for ag. But here's the thing. The agricultural wait list, oh, sorry, for Big Island is the largest wait list we have for agriculture. This many people waiting for an agricultural homestead. So that's why we're focusing on Big Island. 
We have the most lands here. And by the way, that means that you know, in the future, this is going to, you know, this is a trust in perpetuity. There's going to be a lot more activity with Hawaiian homelands on this island, I think, because simply because our land base is here, 58% of it. So <clears throat> I love this place. This is beautiful, and I just love to see it because usually when we come into our properties, they don't have water. Nothing like this. Um, why Honomu? I think it's obvious, you know, it's, it's accessible. We have a road going right up the middle, literally the middle of the property. We don't have that usually. It's arable land, you know this. This is the best part. The rainfall here, you know, it's rain-fed crops that are occurring here, rain-fed crops. And even though we're facing drier times, it's still a lot of water from what we're used to having. In Honomu, we have access to support networks, whether it's CTAR and other um, homestead, agricultural homesteads in Waimea, in Pana'ewa, Maku'u, that can help. We have, as I was explaining, a good relationship with this county, much better than with other counties, Hawaii County, we have a very good relationship with. We have an MOU, a Memorandum of, of Understanding in place, so we can actually get things done without that stuff getting in the way. It's already been worked out. So that's a good situation to work with the county here. And as I was saying, of course, it has the longest list. If you're interested, this is our land base on Big Island. I just I already noted to you it's 58%, but that's 118,000 acres of land. That we, that we own and have to manage on this island. I should mention that <clears throat> the, the acts set aside different lands, but Honomu was not one of those lands. Honomu came much later. In 1995, if you recall, there was all this settlement where the state had to settle with the department for breach of trust, basically, of things that were done wrong and so we got money and we got land. We got land, for instance, in Kapolei. We have, and this is one of the tracts of land that we got from the state in payment or in, to settle the claims against the state. So it came into our inventory late in 1995. Actually, we got the deed probably in 1997. So that's when we got to start looking at this, this parcel. Um, this is our... <clears throat> I don't want to hit the wrong hit. This is our, um, okay, you guys know where you are. I'm going to, there. So the town, this is going Mauka to the Akaka Falls, right? This is the road, and here's our lands on both sides of the road. 465 acres on one side. As you're going up on the right side, 301 acres on the left side. Uh-oh, malware coming in. <laughs> Right now we have um, people, we have, we have pasture, it's being used for pasturing basically, um, for cattle and some diversified agriculture on our lands under like a temporary right of entry, month to month kind of agreements. That's, that's what's happening on the land right now. Um, more of our lands. So the last question I want to address is how do we get to awards? Where are we in this planning process? So first of all, very early in the planning process, I tell people we don't even have one bubble on a map yet. Not even a bubble. Not, I mean, we, it's that early that we're coming to consult with you. I think some of the lessees are kind of, Where's, are you awarding lots? It's like, no, 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 we're inviting you to a planning process. And that's what we're doing here. It's like inviting you to a planning process to, to help us to to build the best kind of community or agricultural setting that we can. We're looking for your assistance. We've got people, consultants online that we have hired. Uh, Sherry Townscape is a master kind of contract uh, um, planner. And we have had different, different expert, e experts in the field come out and do their studies on the land already. So we're kind of getting more information about the land. What we're aiming for is a conceptual plan, conceptual land use alternatives. What generally do we want to see where, right? 
And so we can come up with some alternatives. This arrow says, we are here. We haven't developed those alternatives yet. So we're coming to introduce the project to open the, the planning process up to the community and also to our beneficiaries. Tomorrow night we'll be meeting with them. When we get honed in on a conceptual plan, we can then go into our environmental assessment process, chapter 343. This involves state land, so we are bound by 343 to do an environmental assessment of impacts, right? Mitigating impacts, identifying impacts. So the environmental assessment kicks in once we have an idea of some general alternatives of what we want to do. And here's the new thing that we're trying to do. We're saying that usually we have to wait till we're finished with that, then the engineers downstairs of our department will pick up the project and start doing their lotting scheme. We're looking at this as once we get the conceptual alternatives done and we're like identifying the impacts, the team can all, the engineer group can already start looking at how this is going to lay out so we can do this a little faster in terms of getting people on the land. And remember we were saying about the opportunity to develop support programs. So before we make any awards, we want to make sure that that programmatic framework is in place so that that's going to be available for them from the get-go. And that start at the end, that's the end of 2018 when we hope to be making these awards for subsistence ag leases at Honomu. Take it. Thank you, Julie. So um, we're soon, we're going to be getting into the question and answer portion of this meeting. Um, so just to kind of tee that up, what are we looking at? We're looking at subsistence agriculture. Um, when we're looking at the subsistence agriculture, yes, we want to get that on the land, but as Julie mentioned, there are some... Por oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Echoes. Um, there are portions of the land where we're not going to be able to put in subsistence ag, just because um, we have some features like streams going through. We want to be able to protect those streams, maybe put a buffer around them. Um, we are getting some information from our other land use um, consultants, so we had a biologist go out. Is there anything of concern? Okay, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll speak slower. So we had a number of environmental specialists go out. So we had a biologist go out to take a look at are there any um, endangered species on the land? Are there any species of concern? Um, so that's going to also factor into you know, how we identify where we should put things. Um, we had an archaeologist go out to take a look to see if, if there's anything out there that we should be concerned about. So there's going to be some resource management as well. Um, and then, of course, there's going to be some infrastructure. And this is a rural setting, so we want to make sure that the infrastructure is appropriate for a rural setting. We don't want to over-design. Um, not only does that take longer, it raises costs, and it really probably wouldn't fit in with this area. So there are a number of land uses that we are considering. 